Uh, okay, we're ready to begin, and we, uh, you know, we'll hope that our microphones follow very soon. I want to welcome uh, uh, Dan and Michelle to the uh, to our uh, uh, our events, our our uh, gathering, and I want to introduce Dan here, uh, who's uh, no stranger to Loyola. He is uh, the Canisius Postdoctoral Fellow and Lecturer of Religious Studies at Fairfield University, which is our sister uh, Ignatian, or Jesuit University to the east, uh, where he's also affiliated with uh, the Center for Catholic Studies and the Ignatian Residential College. Uh, he teaches courses in Christian theology and Catholic social teaching. Uh, Dan received his doctorate here in theology and ethics uh, in 2016 having written a dissertation on the uh, ecological impacts of warfare and the ramifications for Catholic social thought. Dan is co-editor of the Berrigan Letters, personal correspondence between Daniel and Philip Berrigan, available now uh, through all your sellers. Uh, that came from Orbis in 2016. Uh, and Dan also is, uh, has a book in progress on the theology of Daniel Berrigan, which he's tentatively entitling Devotedly uh, in the Lord. Uh, while Dan um, loves Loyola and he got his doctorate here, I know his heart belongs to Mother Fordham, his alma mater. Uh, he's a true New Yorker, and I did catch something on Facebook. He was criticizing Chicago pizza uh, recently. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make that known to people. Uh, so maybe in the Q&A, you can, you can, we can pick that up. Uh, my pleasure also to introduce Michelle Nickerson, uh, Dr. Michelle Nickerson is Associate Professor of History at Loyola, where she teaches U.S. women's gender, urban, and political history. She's published two books, Mothers of Conservatism, Women and the Post-War Right, and a volume of essays she co-edited called Sunbelt Rising, The Politics of Place, Space, and Region. Uh, Nickerson gives talks about her work, I should say Dr. Nickerson, this, uh, gives talks about her work as part of the OAH, Distinguished Lecturer Program. She is currently writing about the Camden 28, a group of Catholic radicals arrested by the FBI for raiding a draft board office in opposition to the Vietnam War in 1971. So I think Dan's gonna uh, say a few words and frame things, and there's gonna be a conversation. So please welcome Dan Sotny to the Well, thanks so much for being here, everybody. Um, can I be heard in the back? All right, good. Uh, if, if at any point my voice level drops, just let me know. Um, as uh, Dr. Murphy was saying, this is really a homecoming for me, and it's really great to be back in, uh, in Chicago and more specifically here at Loyola. Um, I spent many very happy years here at Loyola, and some of my most formative education as a theologian occurred right here on this campus. Um, and so I'm just so grateful for that experience, and also really grateful for the position that Loyola has, uh, not only in Chicago, but in the church and the academy throughout the country. Um, so that's, it's, as I said, a real grace to be back here. And uh, again, thanks to Dr. Michael Murphy and the uh, Great Pain Center for having me, and uh, uh, Joe De, De La Rose. Um, and if you haven't yet been to the exhibit that the Hank Center has on the second floor of Damon, you should really check it out. I was there this afternoon. Really uh, worth, worth your while. Um, they've, helped me make, uh, they've helped make me feel at home again uh, here uh, this week, so thanks so much to them. And uh, thanks also to Dr. Michelle Nickerson for being my uh, conversation partner today. Um, so the format is, I'm, uh, Dr. Nickerson asked me just to speak for maybe five minutes, about one of which I've already taken. Uh, just to introduce this, uh, the project uh, of the Berrigan Letters and um, say a few words about that and then we'll get into some questions which Dr. Nickerson will ask me and then you'll have a chance uh, if you have any questions as well. So I first heard about Dan Berrigan when I was a sophomore in college at Fordham University. Uh, one of Dan's Jesuit confreres, uh, a man by the name of Father Simon Herrick, was giving a lecture at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in the Morningside Heights neighborhood in uh, New York City. And uh, my roommate and I decided to go to the lecture, and we were very intrigued by the elderly man who was the respondent to the lecture that evening. It was Dan Barrett. So at the end of the event, we introduced ourselves, and uh, Dan gave us his phone number, 
and told us to make plans to come and see him at his apartment uh, on, the Upper East, on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. And I distinctly remember him saying, uh, if you don't get a hold of me right away, keep trying, I'm worth your time. <laughs> and he was 100% right. Uh, so as soon as we got back to campus that night, we used Google or whatever search engine was in vogue at the time to look, uh, to look up to him. And the, as I learned more and more about him, uh, I was astonished. I had never heard of anybody quite like him before or quite frankly since. Um, in all likelihood, you know many of the highlights already. He was a priest, although one who never wore uh, a clerical collar or liturgical vestments. At his wake, as a matter of fact, I was remembering this uh, last, last night on the plane, uh, at his wake, one of his nieces, uh, I, I overheard her saying to someone else that it was the very first time that she had ever seen her uncle in uh, a, the priestly uh, liturgical vestments as he was living in his castle. He was an playwright, a wordsmith in general. Uh, he was an anti-war activist, burner of draft files, beater of swords into plowshares, ice cream addict, faithful Jesuit, devoted son, loyal brother, and doting uncle, trespasser, proponent of the consistent ethic of life before Cardinal Joseph Bernardine coined the phrase prophet, and on and on. So I had maintained a personal interest in Dan for a number of years after meeting him as a 20-year-old, but the thought of doing a book project like the Berrigan Letters had never really occurred to me. Then, one day in 2013, only a week before, uh, thanks, is this, is this better? Good. Uh, then, one day in 2013, only a week before I left uh, Loyola Chicago to head back east, I was on campus across town at DePaul, where my wife was finishing a uh, master's degree. And while I was there, I discovered in their library a treasure trove, the last ten years of Dan's correspondence. I ended up spending the entire week there reading, uh, reading those letters just for fun. These were letters from Joan Baez, Patch Adams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, the 2007 letter from president of, former president of this university, Michael Garanzini, offering Dan an honorary doctorate, which he received on March 22nd of 2007, and most importantly, the letter from Ben and Jerry, the ice cream proprietors, who were uh, telling Dan about the update in his lifetime supply of their ice cream. <laughs> the letters that were most beautiful, however, were exchanged between Dan and two of, his five, two of his five brothers, Phil and Jerry. The three of them were clearly best friends. Reading those letters was a great privilege. A year or so later, I was chatting with a friend and colleague of mine, Eric Martin, and we openly wondered why no one had taken it upon themselves to edit those letters in a book, uh, book project. And if this was a fair enterprise, we would have also included the letters of the third brother that I just mentioned, Jerry, and his wife, Carol, and Phil's wife, Liz McAllister. But uh, in retrospect, I don't actually think a project of that scope would have been possible. In any event, uh, we thought it would be a fun project to do uh, this book, and so we discussed it with Robert Ellsberg and Jim Keen of Orbis Books, who were incredibly enthusiastic in their support of the project. What followed over the next two years was a labor of love for us. First, it involved three separate trips to Cornell University in upstate New York, where we spent a total of six full days in their library combing through box after box of sorted and unsorted letters. And then finally, two days back here in Chicago at DePaul. On those Cornell trips, we were always housed in the home of Ellen Brady and her children. And I didn't realize until just now that Dr. Nickerson is working on a book on the Camden 28. Uh, Ellen's father, John Brady, was among the Camden 28. So hearing, uh, hearing her regale us the stories of the Berrigans and her own family was a fantastic experience for us. What followed in the project itself was a bit more arduous than either of us could have imagined when we first set out to complete the project. 
There were almost 2,200 letters between Dan and Phil, so we were only able to publish about a quarter of those letters in the final edition of the book, and almost none of the letters appears in full. We actually transcribed every single one of the 22 letters in our database, and then each one of us read each letter. Uh, the only letters that were sort of automatically left on the cutting room floor were letters that sort of appeared to be duplicates by Phil. Uh, they were not duplicates. He would basically write over a period of days how things were going in prison. And it would be sort of a, a, a basic daily schedule that he underwent every day in prison. So I spent X number of minutes reading scripture, then we celebrated a clandestine uh, Eucharist, then I drank uh, uh, a little bit of milk, and then we had lunch, and so on and on. So we, we only we didn't publish uh, we didn't publish those types of letters, but uh, we tried to get a wide variety of letters in the, in the final in the final volume. Um, uh, Phil wrote a good deal more than Dan did, um, and I attribute this to the fact that Phil spent roughly 11 years of his life in prison. So he had uh, more time to write. Many of the letters from Phil in this book come from prison. Um, so consequently, there are more letters from Phil than from Dan in the book. Um, and as I was saying to Michelle, I hate to sound like a martyr, but in both cases, Phil and Dan, uh, their grammar school teachers failed them miserably in teaching them penmanship. It was very, very difficult to decipher many of their letters. Phil's uh, were more neatly written than Dan's, but in both cases, very, very challenging. Uh, that one complaint notwithstanding, to be honest, Eric and I couldn't have been blessed with better figures uh, on whom to, to, uh, to bring about this volume. Uh, the, two, the two figures complemented each other very well in their writing. And they were not only interesting letters to read, but in a real sense, they were a grace for us to read. Um, so I very much look forward to discussing that grace further. Just have the one microphone, so. not get mentioned um, is what I think a lot of us sort of take for granted that everybody might know about uh, Dan and Phil Berrigan, and that's that uh, they started a, a movement called Catholic Resistance. It was protest against the Vietnam War. It started in 1968 uh, with like two raids, a raid on the Baltimore uh, draft office, and then uh, Catonsville Local 33. Do I have that right? Yes, okay. Um, and then they raided these offices uh, and took the records and destroyed them. Um, sometimes it was by burning them or pouring blood on them. Um, and then there were more than 100 raids of draft board offices after that, mostly up and down the East Coast and in the Midwest. But there was also one in Los Angeles. There was one in Hawaii. It was to place between 1968 and 1971. Um, what's also unique about uh, these raids is that uh, they mostly uh, try to target 1A files. That is, the, uh, the files of those men who were most likely to be drafted. Working class men, um, non-white men, men who were not able to get exemptions and deferments. Uh, and they had a movement that was very Catholic, but at the same time attracted non-Catholics as well. Um, so I wanted, I know a lot of you already know this, but I wanted to give some background before we get started. Um, so one of the first questions I have, pardon me for looking at my phone, I think I printed my questions and left them on the printer. Um, uh, Dan, you say at the outset of the volume that you published this book to be a spiritual resource, which I thought was really interesting. I know why the letters are interesting to me um, as a scholar, as a Catholic, as uh, a political activist, but um, can you go into a little, little bit more detail about uh, what you were thinking? Um, so at the outset, I, I would certainly say that we're very happy that 
some scholars have taken this book and used it for their own research. Um, uh, part, of the, part of one thing that has bothered uh, Eric, my co-editor, and myself about uh, the Berrigans is that very often scholars don't take their work seriously. And to be fair, it was, um, it was uh, the feeling was mutual in many ways. I was just telling, um, I was just telling someone over lunch that uh, a few years ago I audited a class at Union Seminary in New York with uh, Father Roger Haight teaching the course, and it was, the course was on the Berrigans. And uh, Roger had been a Jesuit seminarian uh, studying at the old Woodstock Jesuit Seminary, and uh, they had invited Dan to come and speak there. And sitting in the front row, uh, right next to one another, were uh, uh, John Courtney Murray and Avery Dulles, two of the foremost Jesuit theologians of the 20th century. And someone from the audience asked Dan what he thought about studying theology as an academic discipline. And Dan said, as it's being practiced right now, not very, not very much. And he said that while looking right at Dulles and Murray in the front row. So uh, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of tension between them. However, that point notwithstanding, I think there is a lot of substantial fare for scholars to, to chew on. So we very much uh, are happy that some scholars are doing that. But in saying that we wanted it to be a spiritual resource, um, we also were cognizant that for both Dan and Phil, uh, the spiritual life was exceptionally important to them. Uh, they frequently in these letters talk about how important it is um, to celebrate the Eucharist. And in point of fact, that is one of the things that did not change from the 1940s even into the 2000s for both of them. Uh, so that was incredibly important, often talking about prayer. Um, and then to remember that it was their understanding of scripture and their own, uh, their own spiritual lives that was at the heart of them doing these actions. Uh, so because spirituality uh, was so important to them, uh, we felt that, it, that, you know, one of the things we hoped that people got out of this was that their words could be a spiritual guide to others um, and that it might be a spiritual resource. So um, I, I want to I stress the both end of that, though, that it's not just sort of pie-in-the-sky spirituality, but there's also a lot of intellectual fervor there as well. Thanks. Um, that, um, every time I you open your mouth, I'm learning something new about uh, Dan and Phil. Um, kind of building on that answer, uh, I was wondering if the letters, and by extension, the knowledge of the Berrigans that you've gained, if uh, they have shaped you personally, either in a spiritual or political sense, intellectual? The short answer is yes. Um, the, the longer answer is uh, these were such complex figures. Um, so what I, I don't know, I don't recall off the top of my head if it ever comes up in the letters that are published here, but neither Dan nor Phil uh, were eligible to vote. And even if they, even if they had been, I don't know that they would have. And I, as I say that in the year 2018, in our, particular, in our particular moment in this country, I understand that that is an extraordinarily difficult position uh, to hold or to promote. But they were, very, uh, they were very fair in the sense that they really detested people of both political parties. Um, you know, I... I um, I am really, I'm somebody who's a great fan of the work that former President Jimmy Carter does, for example. Uh, seems to be a very, a very stand-up person, uh, works diligently even well into his 90s uh, with Habitat for Humanity, teaches a Bible study at his local, par uh, local uh, church in, in Georgia. But the Berrigans in this book uh, absolutely you know, pull no punches in calling uh, Jimmy Carter a Pharisee. I mean, this is incredible. So, I mean, they, from a political standpoint, it's very difficult to say that the Berrigan brothers are going to be my political sort of uh, guidepost, and then to say, well, I'm going to support such and such a candidate. That would be totally foreign to them. Um, 
So on some days, to answer, your, to answer your question finally, on some days that is a guide, but then on other days I have a very hard time uh, saying that one political candidate would not be better suited for office than another. And for the Berrigans, they said, no, everybody is, is a death dealer who's working in politics. Simple as that. Uh, some maybe to more, but to a greater degree than others, but they, they were very uh, equally uh, critical of Republicans and Democrats in, in the letters that I read. So nobody, there is almost, I can't quite think of a single politician that escapes their, that escapes their, uh, their wrath. Um, so that's the, the political answer to your question. The, um, the other answer to your question as far as have they been an influence on me uh, personally, I mean, I, I've taken them on as, as, a, as a, uh, an intellectual project. So certainly in that regard, as I said it at the outset, I've never, I've never really uh, read of anybody else quite like them. Um, uh, and so I, I am just endlessly fascinated by them. Um, and something that I think all of us can benefit from, whether or not we agree with them on this or that issue, is that they lived incredibly integral lives. And by integral, I mean there was nothing phony about them. Uh, whatever they believed, they, they preached, and then they practiced, and they put into practice. And um, that is, that's a virtue that we're in, uh, it, that's in short supply, I think, in, in public life today. So I think that's something that we can all, we can all draw from, and, and uh, I, I certainly take it seriously. I don't, I don't profess to be, um, to be as, as strong as they were um, on any issue, but I'm certainly challenged by them. Um, thanks. Uh, it's interesting. I, I, several of us have talked about how would Dan or Phil respond to what's happening right now um, if they were asked what, what's happening in the church um, and in American politics. And so to, that they wouldn't vote, it, it's interesting to me except that I also know that they were influenced by Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker. And it's very common, I mean, it, part of that movement is um, a, kind of a withdrawal from the structures of American politics and to not vote. Um, and for that reason, Dorothy Day has been, and her movement has been called anarchist. Uh, would, you, would you agree? I mean, is this, were they anarchists? Sorry, I didn't put that in the question. That's fine. <laughs> uh, first of all, you're absolutely right about the influence of Dorothy Day. I, I would say, I mean, Dan has Dan is on record as saying that after, um, other than other than Phil, Dorothy Day is certainly um, his number one source in how to live a Christian life. Um, Thomas Merton was also one as well. But you know, I, it's it's so interesting because there was. Uh, a major difference of opinion between Dorothy Day and Dan Berrigan, and Phil Berrigan for that matter, on uh, some of the civil disobedience that they carried out. Um, so Dorothy Day did not, uh, did not and would not counsel anybody to do the kind of action that, that the Berrigans and their seven uh, colleagues did in Catonsville. Um, that, that was too, there was too fine of a line, and Dorothy Day was somebody who risked arrest and was arrested herself for civil disobedience, but there was a distinction uh, for, for Dorothy between, uh, between you know, not, not abiding by an air raid drill and, and uh, destroying property. There was a distinction there for, uh, for her. Um, are they anarchists? I, I certainly in one sense, yes, but in another sense, there is a great order to all of their lives. And uh, I mean, you know, uh, for, for one, and I, I know I've said this already, but it was so important to all three of them, they were, their, their daily practice was, was structured around, uh, around prayer, both personal prayer and communal prayer. Each of the three of them, uh, for each of the three of them, Dan Berrigan, Phil Berrigan, Dorothy Day, the Eucharist was a central part of their life. Um, 
uh, reading scripture was a central part of their life. Um, but they also believed very much, and you hinted at this in your question, what would they say about the reality that we're facing today? Even in the, in the church, um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't guess to, to say precisely what they would say, but it, it would be, a, again, a both and. They were very Catholic in that regard. It was not, it, even, even though they were all very rigid in their opposition to warfare and to killing, um, and to uh, upholding the rights and human dignity of the poor, uh, there was really a both and that was at the heart of their thought. So they would, they would say, well, our answer to this scandal in the church right now would be both fidelity to the sacraments and to prayer and to community and absolute critical behavior uh, in the face of indifference on the part of the hierarchy. And uh, for, for both of them, uh, or for all three of them, I should say, their lives would be incomplete without both of those things. Uh, a, solid, a solid prayer life, both personal and communal, and a solid, uh, a solid abhorrence of sitting by and watching injustice done, no matter what that was. Um, it was interesting to me how you mentioned in your introduction that uh, the letters that you read were also strongly represented uh, by their other brother, Jerry, his wife, Carol, and Phil's wife, Elizabeth McAllister. Um, I was wondering where, and I, I've wondered this for a while, where did Jerry fit in? Um, I, I know a lot about Liz, so I'm not going to ask you to go on. Um, maybe you introduced everyone. Um, who she was, mm -hmm. but really, why is why? I mean, I, I guess I kind of know why Dan and Phil. But can you talk a little bit about Jerry? Yeah. Um, so the the Berrigan family um, had six children. All six were boys. I'm, if I'm squinting a little bit, it's that the sun is hitting me directly in the face. So I'll try to be as uh, as least amount of awkwardness as possible in, in uh, answering this. Uh, there were six boys in the Berrigan family. Uh, the three oldest boys, Thomas, John, and James. Uh, and then you could basically draw a dash because they had a different ideological bent than their three younger brothers. Um, Jerry comes fourth, Dan is fifth, and Phil is the youngest. And as I said at the outset, Jerry, Dan, and Phil were all best friends. Um, they, Jerry lived most of his life, if not all of his life, in Syracuse, New York, which is where the family had moved. Uh, so at least all of his adult life in, in uh, Syracuse, New York. He himself had been a seminarian, left the seminary, and, uh, and married uh, his wife, Carol. Um, but he was, uh, he was an incredible person himself. Uh, ideologically along the same line as Dan and Phil, he would often get arrested in local actions in upstate New York. Um, and as Dan often wrote, uh, Jerry uh, taught for many decades actually at a community college, taught English at a community college in, in upstate New York. And uh, Dan, was, Dan often wrote his admiration for how Jerry used uh, the anti-war movement in his English classes. Um, he was also the family archivist, uh, so he had all of the family, uh, the family, uh, the family tree, and kept kept many of these letters um, and many other letters that were then moved either to Cornell or to DePaul, uh, where the archives are. Um, he died in 2015. Um, so, as a matter of fact, as far as I know, one of the last one of the last trips that Dan made out of the, the Jesuit infirmary in New York was to Jerry's funeral. Um, but they were incredibly, incredibly close, as were their families. Liz McAllister had been a, uh, a, a religious sister in the religious, the Sacred Heart of Mary uh, religious order. And um, she ended up leaving the convent, uh, and Phil Berrigan, who had been a Josephite priest, left the priesthood uh, without uh, the, the dispensation that would have been necessary from their respective religious superiors. So by doing that, 
they were um, excommunicated from the Catholic Church. The excommunication was lifted later in their lives. Um, and to be, to be fair, uh, even while the excommunication was in effect, they considered themselves very much a part of the Catholic Church. Um, they, still, uh, they still took part in the sacraments. Um, and it, it is interesting to note, too, uh, that their, their marriage, which had been a secret uh, to almost everyone, Dan and Jerry included, um, was a source of consternation in their family. Um, not so much because, well, I guess it depends on the person. But to Dan, at least, Dan was much more upset that, that Phil hadn't told him about this than that he left, um, that he left uh, the priesthood. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a complex family. And just to say one more word about the three older brothers, at various times, there were points when uh, various members of the Berrigan family openly uh, opposed their brothers who had, who had taken these, these stances. Um, one of whom was, was not their mother. Their mother's name was Frida, after whom Phil's oldest daughter is named. Um, but she, she was asked by a reporter, uh, what do you think about your sons breaking the law? And she, re she replied, it wasn't God's law that they broke. Um, so that she was a major source of support and universally beloved by all of the, all of the children, which, un un which was unlike their father. Some of the brothers had better experiences with the father than others, but I guess I'll leave it there. Going off on a tangent. Well, I, I actually have several more questions, but I wanted to leave some time uh, for for you, the audience, to ask questions or make comments um, as we come to the close of this panel. Um, I can run the mic back and forth. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Clear. Well, I apologize to you. Uh, the Palm Court usually has two of these speakers. We only have one receiver here, so we have one microphone. So we'll do our best, okay? Thanks. Going into, I just love the scripture. It says, you know, probably swords from the cloud share spiritual ego to the blood. Are there other things that, in scripture that sort of stood out and really helped inspire and form it? So you're right, the, the swords into plowshares from Isaiah would be one for sure. Um, he, it, it's very difficult to say just one, so if I, could, if I could defer and just say, I'm gonna take the easy way out here. He um, was, uh, this probably will come as not much of a surprise to many of you, a, a huge fan of the Beatitudes, um, uh, especially blessed are the peacemakers. Um, and was also a, a great fan of apocalyptic biblical literature. So uh, the, the book of Revelation, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the readings from his funeral came from the book of Revelation. One was the, um, one, uh, one was the Beat the Swords into Plowshares from Isaiah, one was from the book of Revelation, and one was uh, the raising of Lazarus. So. I would presume that he chose those himself, so I would imagine that those three would be three good places to start, along with the Beatitudes as well, as far as, um, as, far as things that, that really moved him from Scripture. But uh, he was a very prolific exegete. He has books of exegesis on, I'm guessing, like 20 different books of the Bible, both Hebrew Scriptures and New Testament. So, um, yeah, he was... He, he did a great deal of reading of scripture. Um, so since I, I know you, I know that you met with Dan right before he died, and I was wondering if you might share some like morsels of wisdom. I know that he knew that you were writing a book on him, so I was just curious about that. Thanks so much. Uh, that's exactly right. And I should, have, I should have actually brought this up in my introduction as well. When we were first uh, envisioning writing this book, uh, Dan had recently moved to the Jesuit infirmary uh, right off campus at Fordham. And so uh, Eric and I went to, uh, to visit Dan and to, uh, to talk to him about this book. At the time, Dan uh, still held the copyright 
to all of the letters that he had written. Uh, so we actually needed his permission to, to publish them. Uh, he was incredibly supportive um, in, in the endeavor. Um, as, far as, as far as sort of last bits of wisdom, I, I must say that there wasn't much in those last two visits. Uh, he was, towards the end of his life, uh, you know, as, as many people, this has come as a huge surprise, he had good days and bad days, but um, I, I do remember <laughs> he, the last time we visited him, he was uh, wondering if, uh, <laughs> if it would be a good idea to perform a public exorcism on the business school at Fordham University. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, and I, I hope none of the business students here take, take, uh, take offense at that. Um, but he was, uh, so, but he, he said that with, uh, with laughter. Um, as well, but I, I don't doubt for a minute that he would, he would have done it in a heartbeat. Um, but there's one, uh, two, two things, if I could, just go back to earlier visits with him. We met with him uh, two times when he was living uh, in the apartment on the Upper West Side of, in Manhattan. And um, there are two things I remember about, uh, about those visits. Somebody in our group had asked him uh, about how uh, he engaged in activism with both Catholics and non-Catholics. And I just remember him looking and, and saying with the, most, the utmost sincerity, he says, I walk with whoever wants to walk with me. And it's just, you know, just a, such a sincere, heartfelt response. And then the, the, the second of those visits, he asked us at the end of the visit if we wouldn't mind if, if he said a little prayer before we left. And I don't recall any of the content of the prayer with the exception of the very beginning. We were, we were sort of huddled up in a circle, and he opened the prayer simply by saying, hey, God of peace, just, and, and just really be feeling that I was in the presence of somebody who had a very, very, very close relationship with God. Like, he could just address God like that. Uh, those, those really resonate with me. I should add one more thing that Dr. Nickerson was talking about the draft board uprisings that, that came up after the Baltimore Four and the Catonsville Nine. The single best resource uh, on that is uh, a documentary film called Hit and Stay. And the person who asked me that last question, Dr. Karen Ross, gifted me with that DVD. So I would I highly recommend it to everyone here. That is a fantastic film. Thanks. Any one or two more? Feel free. Yeah. I'm going to use up all of our 45 minutes here. Um, I wanted to know, as uh, basically as a someone who is also a writer um, and went to graduate school, <laughs> uh, how you did this while doing everything else, like writing a dissertation. Um, you know, a lot of us can hardly imagine fitting anything else in. So can you talk a little bit about how that worked? It, it, was, um, it was quite a process. Uh, this book and the dissertation actually completed within one month of each other. Um, I, 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 I didn't have much in the way of teaching at the, at the particular time when I was working on the dissertation and the Berrigan uh, collection. Um, so it really was sort of full days of transcribing letters and writing the dissertation and sort of going back and forth. But, Actually, in my, my experience of those two particular, um, those two particular uh, projects simultaneously is that um, they really, they enhanced, they enhanced the other one. At that point in time, I started the dissertation about a year or a year and a half before we started the Berrigan letters. And so by the time that we had started the Berrigan letters, I just wanted to get the dissertation over with. And I wanted to be done with that project, and so um, doing this somehow uh, helps me, you know, get get more work done. I don't know; it seems counterintuitive, but it just worked out well in that regard. 
Um, yeah. I don't have a, some sort of magical answer to that. I wish I did, or otherwise my next book would be done. Right? Yeah. Okay, does anyone else have a question? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.